Okay, thanks for your patience. Um, our first speaker in this session will be Claire Motu, and she will talk about the Spiru wavelength calibration. Um, Claire, if you want to share your screen. Yeah. It looks good. All right, perfect. Okay. Go ahead. Can you hear me? I guess so. Mm. Okay, so I'm going to present to you the way we calibrate uh, the wavelengths uh, with Spiru. So I'm not going to talk about the instrument itself um, because you've heard about it already, just the calibration module. Uh, so the calibration module is uh, able to feed the spectrograph in two ways, one direct way through the uh, yellow fiber directly from the calibration module to the spectrograph. And the second way is going through the Casgrain unit going through the optics of the parameter of Spiro, and then taking the science fiber, both science fibers, uh, back to, to feed the spectrograph. So this way, uh, we, we can uh, achieve a, a calibration of all channels uh, together or separately. And uh, the way we use uh, the, the, the lamps that we're using for the wavelength solutions are the fabri perot etalon and the holocathode, which is the uranium lamp. Um, we have a secondary way to uh, calibrate the fabri perot etalon, which is using the LFC uh, from the Menlo system. And uh, during the night, so we are doing these uh, full sequences, uh, feeding the spectrograph both ways in the afternoon and mornings. And during the night, we observe stars, of course, through the both ch uh, science channels and the fabri per fabri etalon uh, for the simultaneous calibration reference. So that's for the hardware. And of course, the software is very important. And I will tell you a little bit how we work. Uh, and all the details are in this paper by Neil Cook. Uh, and you probably have, um, have uh, meet, meet uh, Neil in the, in the conference. So this is how our uh, spectra look like once they are extracted, both the fabri perot and the uranium neon lamp uh, spectra. So as you can see, there are many lines. Uh, there are a bit fewer lines in the K-band, but we can still calibrate this channel uh, and this band. So we have a bit more than 30,000 lines of uranium neon in the full uh, spew domain, which gives us an internal precision of three meters per second. And uh, in addition to that, we have 20,000 lines of the fabri perot uh, which gives us an internal precision of 0.1 meter per second. So the method we're using, we are uh, relying a lot on a reference calibra calibration set, uh, which would give us uh, the first order or the first guess or the reference to our calibration. And then every night we measure the discrepancy to this uh, reference. Uh, so we do that by fitting Gaussian fit Gaussian lines to holocated lines, and uh, Fabri and uh, Fabri Perot lines are fit by uh, array functions, and we do that iteratively for all slices of all fibers, so that we we get a perfect geometry uh, distortion from the re reference. We have a quality control which on several parameters, which give us uh, a good way to discard um, bad calibrations and keep those that we want to keep in a database. And the wavelength solution is obtained with a fifth order polynomial, polynomial fit of the chromatic cavity um, as uh, detailed in these two papers. So, uh, of course, the fabri perot is controlled in pressure and temperature. There is a leak, which is uh, within spec, so it's uh, as expected, of uh, 2 to the minus 3 millibar per day. And uh, there is internal control of the temperature uh, in three layers. So the most internal part of the, of the fabri perot is um, controlled with an RMS of 1 millik. And this is the absolute drift that we have been measuring in the last two years when the instrument was quite stable. And you see what, that what is dominating is the pressure leak. So uh, it gives us um, a drift of 0.25 meter per second per day, uh, which is totally acceptable and uh, feasible for the wavelength solution that we uh, update every day. 
And then when you follow a given star uh, over uh, this longer period of several years, uh, this is the, um, the green points are the simultaneous calibration that we get uh, on the reference uh, channel. And it has for a given star uh, an RMS of about one meter per second. Uh, in this case, um, another way to measure the, the the goodness of the wavelength calibration is to see how the science and reference channel uh, vary from from night to night, and this is also done on the calibrations. Uh, as you can see, in the full lifetime of Spiru, we have had a, a little bit less stable times at the beginning, and then it became much more stable. Uh, the global RMS of this um, difference of velocity is 0.2 meter per second, which is uh, already good and within spec. Um, and we got uh, six centimeter per second on the most uh, uh, stable last two years. Uh, so now the limitations that we are seeing and things that can, I think can still be improved. Um, we have persistence problems, and this has been discussed <laughs> already in this uh, meeting. So, for instance, if you take a given night and you see what, how the drift is doing uh, during this night, uh, you will see some gems uh, at uh, certain times when the flux of the of the star is changing. So you see that both on, on the star ch channel and the drift channel. But the amplitude may be a bit different um, on the Fabry Perot or on the stellar spectrum. So I think there is a way to improve uh, things and get a, a better uh, estimation of the drift um, uh, correcting for this persistence in, this, in the differential way. Uh, However, for a given star, I should say that uh, it's, it is uh, always the same flux level. So I think we are much uh, less affected than it seems. The second limitation that we may have um, is that the pipeline assumes that the cavity changes are chromatic, while they are not. Like in other instruments, we see the 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 the, the Fabry Perot etalon has a um, acro, uh, has a chromatic change uh, in uh, the cavity length. So uh, this is. Um, uh, I've done that recently. It's the relative J minus H uh, velocity for the for the Fabry Perot spectrum uh, against time for the three or four years of um, operations of Spirou. Uh, and as you can see, there is a, some some uh, amplitude uh, like a peak to peak of five meter per second, and this is not taken into account because the pipeline assumes the an anachromatic change. So I think there's, there's a way to improve things here. And finally, uh, what we plan to do in the future but has not been implemented in the pipeline yet is to uh, have uh, the LFC to anchor the wavelength uh, solution better. So this is how it will look like our spectra and all the lines, much more lines available, especially in the J and H, K. Uh, J and H bands where these um, chromatic changes are the most uh, visible, we will be able to uh, calibrate them better with the LFC. So I think that's that's what, that's uh, what I, I got for you. Thank you. Questions from the audience. Hello, thank you for, for the talk. Uh, I have a question about this pressure leak. I mean, you say it's in spec and I guess the numbers add up, but is it by design or is it in spec? Um, so uh, I think this is, um, so uh, yeah, we, you're referring to this. Um, it's, uh, it, it, I think it's by design because uh, it, it was, uh, it was from the design document that I, I got the, the specification. So, yeah, there is no no need for a better uh, pressure control apparently. Any other question back in the room? Hi, Claire. Thanks for the talk. Um, the last plot you showed 
with um, the no the two before. Sorry about that. Yeah, that one. So if that's attributed to the chromatic drift of the etalon, then why is that not a plot that's more linear? Or why does it go down and then back up? Are you sure that's? I mean, have you traced this to the um, chromatic drift, or do you think it's the thermal stability? which at the millikelvin level also shouldn't generate so much of an amplitude, or are you just not sure what that is? Yeah, I'm not sure at the moment what, what that is exactly. Um, uh, I've heard that uh, other Fabri-Perot etalon get similar things, but maybe more linear with time. So I'm not sure about the up and down. Uh, what I know is that the minimum point we have here uh, corresponds to the time where we change something in the thermal uh, control of the etalon. So it may be a mixture of both, actually. Maybe the, the, the right part after the, this minimum is, uh, is the real chromatic change, and the left part is more a thermal stability problem. But uh, this, would be, this would need to be uh, checked more in details. Okay, I think the last question from me. Um, I hope it's not too complex. Um, can you say one word about um, the um, drift solution, how you apply that? Is that something that you apply line by line from the um, uh, etalon lines, or is this one drift number for the whole spectrograph for a single frame? Yeah, it's uh, one number for the whole. But we do have the line by line of, uh, uh, of the stellar spectra and the fabric uh -huh. So okay. we could do we could do chromatic uh, drifts. Totally. Okay. Great. Yes. Bonjour, Claire. C'est Etienne. Uh, okay. Yeah. Just just so uh, just to clarify things on how it's corrected, we have a, a, a as Claire said uh, the uh, starting point wavelength solution. Then you say therefore that you're one number with a fabric pair, you're one number away from an absolute calibration. So it's, you add a cavity, a, a chrom, an achromatic. So with what Claire showed, it, it's to be revisited, but we had an achromatic change in the cavity length. So you're that number away from an absolute calibration. So we just say, oh, tonight we have zero cavity change. We check where our hello cathode lines fall, and we iterate that cavity until they are at, basically they haven't moved. So you, you anchor back your cavity change to the, the value that gives you no motion of your hollow cathode lines. That's the idea. You could have a chromatic dependency, but then it adds like the degree of freedom. So you eat up one degree of freedom. So you have to get a slope, then it, it's, it could worsen or improve. And, and what, well, yeah, with the laser calm, of course, we would have more lines. Then you can have a level, maybe it's, it may be worth it for the, that chromatic change. So yeah, that, that's the, the way it works. That's for the drift of the etalon. The drift of the spectrograph is it's okay. That's for the drift of the etalon. The drift of the spectrograph, we basically have an affine transform that, that puts your Fabri Perot peak back on onto a reference Fabri Perot. Okay, so you have a so affine transform, so it's a linear transform with shears and, and scales and rotation. And then so so all spiral observation, all nice, we say go back, put the Fabri Perot peaks where, where they are, then you Kind of encode into that a very tiny effect due to the change in the cavity, but then you update your wavelength solution so such that your hollow cathodes are always seen at no motion. Basically, that's the way we do things. It's a Neil's paper. Neil's paper. Okay. All right. Thanks again, uh, Claire. Okay. And um, our next speaker is Joe Nina, and he's also online, um, and he will tell us about the HPF wavelength solution. So Joe, you can uh, share your screen if you want. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, thanks. Uh, let me share. Uh, I hope you can see the presentation mode of the slides. Yes, that looks great. All right. Take it away. Uh, all right, thank you. Uh, all right, so, uh, uh, and Joe, I'll uh, quickly uh, talk about how we are doing the wavelength calibration on HPF uh, instrument on behalf of the HPF team. Uh, just to remind people, uh, HPF is a you know, EPRB fiber per, uh, spectrograph on the 10 meter Hobie Eberly telescope uh, in Texas, US, McDonald Observatory. 
Uh, this is a you know, standard by people design, but this is a near infrared and we use a VPH as a cross disperser. Uh, the wavelength coverage, uh, we go uh, Z, Y, and J, that is 820 to uh, 1280 nanometers. And the resolution is of HPF is about 55,000. We use a 1.7 micron cutoff H2RG detector. The main wavelength calibrator source on this instrument is uh, in EOM laser frequency comp developed by our collaborators at NIST. Uh, we also take Etlon uh, when laser frequency comp is not there. Uh, we, um, we are currently not using thorium argon and uranium neon for the uh, daily wavelength solutions. Uh, however, uh, we still take it every day uh, as a backup because in future, if we ever want to go back, check something, uh, we have it there. So we, we still take it uh, as part of the calcium codes. Uh, this is just an uh, overview of how the HPF uh, um, data looks. I mean, this, uh, we have the sky spectrum, science spectrum, and then the calibration spectrum. Uh, we do not always use these days the uh, calibration lamp. Uh, we do not use LFC simultaneously for most of the stars. We still use it for some of them. But for most of the data, we do not uh, do simultaneous. We instead randomly take laser frequency comp throughout the night and we just interpolate the drift. Uh, this has enabled us to take you know, laser frequency comp exposures at constant exposure time uh, and things like that. Uh, uh, this is possible because our LFC is being like fairly uh, operational all the time, like you know, more than 98% uptime. And this is like de facto the main calibrator that we use. Uh, okay, so this uh, the absolute the the master wavelength solution of HPF is we do order by order fit. Uh, we do not do a two D version. Order by order fit, and because we have a lot of laser frequency comb lines, we fit like the the plot over here shows the pixel versus wavelength fit, uh, and the the plot below basically shows the residual. Uh, of the fit we use like a sixth order legendary polynomial. And for most of the orders, uh, the residues that you get uh, when you do a, this uh, sixth order legendary polynomial is fairly randomly distributed around. It's something like around 10 meter per second uh, sigma. Uh, however, um, I should mention there are some orders which we haven't understood yet shows significant non-Gaussian residue. And this, we don't think it is actually a valid solution. This could be some local detector, you no. Know, imperfections or something. We don't fully understand that yet, but I should mention there are some orders where some weird things uh, happening. But otherwise, I mean, it's still the sigmas are still fairly low, but uh, it is there. Uh, so the other point is uh, that once what we realized is that when we are fitting for this uh, wavelength solution, depending on the way you weight uh, the Gaussian fits to the centroid to calculate the centroid of each of the modes of the laser frequency comp, uh, it depending on that, you know, the velocity that you assign, uh, the pixel that you assign for that wavelength uh, changes significantly. Uh, this is what is shown by here and something like around like 80 meter per second or so. Uh, this we believe uh, uh, we are able to trace it down to a slight asymmetry in the line spread function of the HPF. So what is shown over here is like, you know, the, how the PSF of the HPF changes when you go from the blue side of the order all the way to the red side of the order. Uh, on the blue side, we are fairly symmetric, so it is much more insensitive, but on the red side, that's a slight asymmetry in the PSR. That is what uh, is causing this thing. Uh, so basically, you know, if you had to calculate the centroid of a line, the fitting a Gaussian is always like the easiest uh, because it's a very simple model. Uh, however, if you are trying to fit a symmetric Gaussian model to an asymmetric line per function, if you do like the optimal one by uh, photon noise weighting kind of scheme, then you become sensitive to the flux of the line, which is a big uh, issue for laser frequency comb because the laser frequency comb lines are not you know, constant flux thing. They vary all over the place. So to make it insensitive to that, uh, we decide to not use any weights when you do the fit so that you, know, you are insensitive to the flux variations of the LFC line. Uh, also a valid point for you know, uh, we do it. If we, are, if we cannot have a perfect loss dispersion profile, like a non-optimal extraction will give you better results than an optimal extraction uh, for the laser frequency comp line. Uh, for, uh, where, for many of these studies, we had to uh, know the line profile of the instrument well, and our laser frequency comp F0 can be uh, sweeped. So we did that sweeping of the F0 so we could sample the line, um, 
different function and different uh, samplings on the pixel. And the plot here shows how the HPF PSF was model from one side of the order to the other side of the order. So you can see how the PSF uh, evolves over time. And once you have the PSF, we could also do some other test to check, you know, like if you are slightly asymmetric thing, the and you can get with centroid and the drift, etc., using an emission line source like a laser frequency comb. But ultimately, you are comparing the centroid of an absorption line uh, star and how much this impacts. And you can see that uh, at least within the HPF PSF, you know, this is a significant impact uh, in terms of the absolute centroid of the line. But the question is then, do you actually care? Because as long as the PSF is fairly stable, which it is when the instrument is stable, uh, do you really care? Uh, you only care it at a higher order level in the sense that because of the barycentric shape uh, at the earth motion, so the stellar line positions will slightly move on your pixel space, which means it's a slightly different instrument PSF. And then there is a delta change happening. So you know, it is it matters for maybe a the feature 10 centimeter per second thing, but for HPF uh, precision, this didn't really matter, but it is good to just check that part. Uh, on the question of how we actually model the drift of HPF, uh, there are uh, mainly two ways to do this, right? Like if one is that you calculate all the centroid and without any prior fit for the, the valence solution, which is like that six degree legendary polynomial or something per order. The other option is that you do that once and then you calculate only for the drift of the instrument so that you have a just a couple of parameters, uh, not you're not fitting for you know six multiplied by the number of orders that you have in, in the spectrograph kind of thing. So which lets you do things more precisely. So in HPF, what we realized is that you know we can just do that drift for a full thermal cycle, which is almost like four years. So we do very carefully calculate one master wavelet solution and then transform that wavelet solution over years uh, by uh, looking uh, at how the LFC positions are changing. So this is our uh, drift model. Uh, so initially we started off with a single parameter model because that's all we could detect uh, in the measurements. Uh, it does a simple pixel shape is what was dominating, which is what is shown in the first plot over here. And there is a daily sawtooth pattern. And then over that, there is this kind of like a, a different events in the observ observatory that goes those jumps. Uh, but in a few years, we realized that there are higher order uh, things. This is one you know, cautionary tale of using this drift model that you have to be constantly checking that your drift model captures all the possible deformations happening to the wavelength solution. Uh, so we had to introduce, uh, so now this is the latest model. We have to introduce two more terms. One is the linear term, which effectively is the scaling or swimming. And then there is this quadratic term. Um, uh, apart from these uh, hydraulic terms, uh, as was mentioned earlier, like in HPF, we also had a weird effect of the drift along the readout direction of the H2RG detector. So that also had to be added in the drift model which is shown over here. Uh, and once we have these uh, drift models, then all we do is that, you know, depending on your stellar epoch, we have like what is shown in this plot over here, we have laser frequency comms taken whenever HPF is not observing, it's completely internal. And when there is a star observation, we just linearly interpolate that uh, that zero order term, which is what is changing inside a night, to that particular epoch. And the way we are fitting this is by template matching. The again, the important part is that because laser frequency flux is highly varying, uh, we do not use optimal one by variance weighting. We instead we just do not do uh, we, we we do not do the weighting. However, it's also important to you know downweigh some of those super bright laser frequency comb lines because they don't otherwise dominate the fits and things like that. Uh, so but that is morning. basically all right. Uh, oh, thanks. Uh, yeah, I think that's all the uh, main points I had. Uh, if there are more questions, I can go. Your 10 seconds. <laughs> thanks, Joe. Uh, questions in the audience? There is a question online. Maybe uh, Ryan can read that to us. Right, from Tobias, uh, you showed for a single order the residuals of the calibration lines with respect to the wavelength solution. Are these residuals about eight meters per second consistent with the photon noise? And if not, what do you suspect is the cause? Uh, yeah, so it is not consistent with photon noise. We have some, um, uh, we don't fully understand exactly what is causing this uh, because and there's definitely some 
So this fit is like after averaging many laser frequency comps. So the photon noise is significantly suppressed, but then the laser frequency comp, as I said, is not a stable flux source. So there is some averaging effect of you know slightly different flux levels, etc., coming in. Um, there, so there, are, you know, we can think of many, you know, detector effects like you know we have some cross patch patch pattern issue which we cannot do by perfect flag correction. So yeah, we, we are not reaching the photon noise limit uh, in this. Uh, that's mainly because uh, you know, we average a lot of laser frequency comps, so the theoretical photon noise limit is much small. But there is definitely some other systematics uh, that is what is the flaw uh, in achieving the high synchronization we have. Awesome. Thanks, Joe. Any other questions? Hi, thank you. Um, you showed briefly the daily sawtooth pattern. Is that the liquid yeah. nitrogen thing? or what? Yeah, right. That is the liquid nitrogen field, which is like a very repeatable straight line triangular pattern. OK, let's move on. Let's thank our speaker again. Thank you. And uh, next one up is Takayuki Kotani, who will speak about the IRD um, wavelength solution. Take it away. Oh, you want to try. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Takai Kotani uh, from Astor Biology Center. So today I do I talk about the uh, wavelength calibration uh, method of ILD. So this this is the brief um, overview of our uh, wavelength calibration. Um, there's no pointer. Ah, uh, okay, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. So um, so IRD uses a uh, uh, laser frequency comb uh, as a uh, as a main uh, wavelength reference. Um, so uh, we uh, when we observe a uh, uh, star. So we always uh, observe uh, a laser uh, LFC uh, light uh, simultaneously, uh, like this. And so about the calibration, so we uh, we uh, so once per uh, uh, it's about once per uh, month um, we generate um, the reference wavelength the scale um, uh, by uh, by using uh, the the method uh, the here. Um, so we uh, first uh, the do the calibration setup. So we split uh, the calibration light, uh, Tori Margon and uh, LFC light uh, to two beams and inject them to the science fiber and the refined calibration fiber simultaneously. Um, and uh, yeah, something like this. So we have uh, um, two, uh, we, we have a one to two splitter, well, broadband splitter. To uh, to send uh, the calibration light to 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 uh, science fiber and the calibration fiber simultaneously. So um, this with this we have uh, Torimargon and Torimargon um, data. Then uh, we get uh, LFC LFC data. So first we use uh, Torimargon data uh, for uh, for very rough uh, wavelengths to get the rough uh, wavelength solution. Um, then uh, using the LFC LFC data, uh, we can uh, we can get the very precise uh, wavelengths uh, scales, um, and for both science fiber and uh, calibration uh, fiber spectra. 
And uh, um, so we use this um, reference uh, wavelength scale, and and uh, we we compare uh, the uh, uh, the observation uh, the stellar uh, observed stellar uh, spectrum and uh, and the reference uh, wavelength wavelength scale to uh, um, uh, to remove the uh, uh, drift of the spectrum uh, uh, to to remove the uh, drift of the uh, spectrometer. So unfortunately, um, so IRD is not very stable uh, as like as a um, uh, very precise uh, radar velocity instrument. So we have uh, sometimes uh, uh, we experience sometimes uh, over 100 meter per second drift uh, per day, uh, which is very large. So we need to uh, remove this drift uh, for precise uh, to derive very precise uh, radar velocity. Um, so usually uh, we. So to do uh, to do that, um, so we measure um, the drift uh, by uh, by using the template uh, matching method, uh, and between the uh, observed spectrum and the reference spectrum, then the uh, um, uh, drift uh, is corrected uh, by uh, by the cross correlation and the function, um, and. Uh, we also use uh, well, LFC uh, information uh, to derive a very precise uh, I, uh, instrument profile IP uh, for further uh, better uh, uh, precise uh, web solution. Um, so this is the well our RV analysis pipeline uh, IID. Um, so that we have low data and uh, and uh, and uh, and, uh, and and the laser comb spectrum. Uh, always uh, we we always take laser comb spectrum and uh, we use uh, LFC light uh, to get uh, 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 instantaneous uh, instrumental profile uh, by using the least square decomposition method and uh, 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 by using this IP uh, information uh, we derive. Uh, uh, the, the the final uh, stellar radar velocity. Um, so this is the example of uh, 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 IP uh, function. Um, so instrumental profile extracted from the LFC, um, and uh, and IP is actually uh, it's it's different uh, from uh, it's it's not same for all segments. So uh, we uh, we we derived uh, the the IP for each segment and and to use it uh, to get the final uh, well, um, uh, real velocity information. <clears throat> um, so lastly, um, so current limitation limitation of our approach. Um, so I'd like to talk about this. Um, so the uh, at first the line intensity of uh, LFC is uh, not uh, constant against the wavelengths. Um, so we sometimes see, uh, see that the very weak uh, LFC uh, at, uh, at some wavelengths and also it's uh, time dependent. So, and, and uh, sometimes at that uh, for such a case, um, LFC uh, are very weak and uh, uh, we have trouble in tracking the instant, uh, instantaneous IP of the spectrograph. And also, um, we use uh, I, we extract IP from the laser com uh, spectrum, but there is no guarantee that the IP extracted from the LFC is the same as uh, the IP for the stellar fiber, uh, because the LFC light is uh, much more coherent than the star light. And uh, it means that it might have uh, more modal noise than the uh, starlight. And also fiber illumination um, is totally different uh, between the LFC and the star. Uh, so LFC, uh, the fiber illumination of LFC is almost, almost uniform, but the star, uh, for the star, it's, it's Gaussian-like uh, illumination. So there might be uh, some systematics. That's it. Questions in the audience? Oh, right there. 
Thank you. Um, I'm not sure I understood uh, why you do not inject the LFC into the science fiber when you do the monthly calibration rather than using this uh, beam splitter on the calibration fiber. Your question is that why we uh, inject uh, the LFC light simultaneously to two defined fibers? I mean, what? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, because we, we, uh, we also need to the wavelength solution for the uh, science fiber as well. And uh, it's also, uh, we also need to, um, uh, well, I mean, but relative position, uh, relative position of the star spectrum be uh, between the star spectrum and the LFC spectrum. Uh, because we use uh, uh, we use the we, we need to uh, remove the instrument the drift um, by comparing the the uh, by, by by template matching between the laser com uh, spectrum and uh, 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 the reference wavelengths uh, solutions. I have a question from Joe online. Joe is asking how narrow are the LFC modes? And he's wondering in particular if it's necessary to do the least squares deconvolution step because uh, the LFC modes might be close enough to a delta function. Um, sorry, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't get you <laughs> your question. Um, so the question is that uh, about the deconvolution process of LFC. Okay, um, so it should be delta function, um, well, in terms of wavelengths, but uh, in reality, the, in the, on the spectrometer, so that the, it's not delta function because of the uh, optical uh, operation. So it's something like the shape, the PSIP shape uh, becomes uh, the Gaussian like shape. Is that? Uh... I think um, your, your pipeline to my knowledge is the only one that takes actually instrumental profile changes into account. So far, most of us are basically knowing that there's something going on, but we are assuming that the instrumental profile stays constant with time, right? Um, and so that, that's, that's kind of a really new approach in a sense, right? That you also, in your template matching process, do something that we have last done with the iodine cell, which is a deconvolution and convolution process to model those changes over time. And um, so my understanding is that that also absorbs part of the drift solution, right? Yeah, okay. I think that was a... I need way on just in Montreal. I'm curious to know about your drift. You said that it's correlated with uh, with temperature. So which temperature is it the, the bench temperature or the, the room temperature or both? The spectrometer camera lens temperature is very sensitive to um, the absolute drift. And uh, um, we, we believe that this, this is due to the, um, the, the electronics uh, instability of the, uh, the temperature controller. Any more questions? Okay. I'm curious if you know, um, so the, the night to night drift of tens, hundreds meters of second, meters per second or so. Um, do you know the extent to which that drift is, is consistent with a single velocity uh, versus something that's not parameterized by just a velocity shift? Well, the, we, we derived the drift, uh, only one drift uh, values. 
So for, for the all, all wavelengths are less. So we assume that the same velocity uh, drift. Yes. All right, let's thank our speaker again. And we are moving on to the next talk, and that's by Ansgar Reiners um, talking about uh, the Kamenis wavelength solution. Okay, I'm I'm going to show you something completely crazy, and that's a wavelength calibration of an RV spectrograph without an LFC. Uh, commonest, as you know, is two spectrographs, um, and this is um, also the, already the answer to many of your questions. Why didn't you do this better? Why did, didn't you do here and there? We, we have two spectrographs to care about, and that's just a lot of work. So, and uh, this, the, the design for everything is now older than 10 years, so forgive us if many of the very modern uh, knowledge that we all have is, is not implemented. You see the spectral format. We have uh, uh, continuous coverage from, from 500 nanometers up to 1.7 micron. Uh, sort of, and we are calibrating with uh, essentially three different kinds of lamps. We have thorium neon lamps, uranium neon lamps, and uranium argon lamps. And this is our, our accuracy anchor, sort of, okay? And then we are using fabri uh, fabri etalons to interpolate between the lines and to get the nightly drift. This is essentially the strategy. And um, to show you something that, that hasn't been shown a zillion times at this conference, uh, I first show you an image of a hollow cathode lamp on the right-hand side. Um, if you wonder what that is, it's not a disk nor a black hole. It's a hollow cathode lamp seen from the front. And uh, here's a uranium argon lamp. This is a spectrum of a uranium argon lamp uh, with a vis spectrograph. So you have the blue part down and the, and the red part up. And I can show you what happens if we, we have the same cathode now, this is uranium neon and argon, and I'll go back and forth and particularly on zoom, excuse me if that is not happening very smoothly, but you can see where the contamination of the, of the gas lines is. So, so you, you want to use um, argon and neon for one of the two. So the neon lines contaminate more, um, contaminate more in the blue and the argon lines contaminate more in the red, which is the reason why people use these in those lamps. And then we also have uranium neon, uh, which is then no, thorium neon. So here you can actually see the difference in the cathode lamps. If anyone asks any questions, if you if you need to know what kind of of kind of lamps you want to want to use, uh, you can use these images. So this is how we essentially cover most of our spectral range with many many lines. We do have, I wouldn't say a sufficient number of lines, but we have many. Uh, it's not as sparse as we've seen in a few other talks. In particular, if you go uh, the, the near infrared, of course, is worse uh, for for the for the vis. Um, this is quite well, this combination of lamps, uh, thorium and uranium is pretty much covering what we need. Um, so this, this is what we use to, to anchor our calibration system. And then for interpolation of the wavelength solution and for nightly drift checks, we are using our etalons. Um, you can see here um, how that looks. And I, I think I don't need to explain anything about these images to this audience here. We have two etalons, one blue, one red, this and near. So we, we painted them or we gave them colors so that we find that we don't, uh, don't confuse them ourselves. You can see our etalon, uh, the image of the etalon uh, in, the, in the center of this slide here. Uh, we are using um, relatively small etalons. I think they are relatively, um, well, almost cheap. And um, they are stabilized uh, in, these, in these containers. And um, one particular thing that we did before we actually started calibration is that we took our etalons and measured the spectra of the etalons in an FTS. And I can totally recommend this to everyone. I can even offer uh, to do it for you because we, we have this thing. Um, so on the left-hand side, you see a close-up of, of a few of these comb, uh, of these comb uh, peaks. And on the right-hand side, you see, you see the curve of the distance of the, of the, um, the distance between the two mirrors in the etalon. And you, can, you cannot see all the red points, but behind this green line, green line there's a lot of uh, red points, which are the individual distances between individual peaks. So in this, in, in our FTS, we can measure the individual line position to an eight meter per second RMS per line, okay? So this, this gives us a very good idea of what we're doing uh, in terms of the, the chromaticity of the, of, of the uh, etalon itself, 
of course, not of the drift, because after we've done that, it ships off to Carmenas, and then we are essentially, we're not lost, but we, we lose control about this. Um, and the, the, the scattery parts that you can see here are actually those that are contaminated by water. Um, so this is something that we've done before. And this is also one of the reasons why we believe we, we have a good handle on the chromaticity even without an LFC. So we have, we have covered the wavelength range more or less well with uranium and thorium. And we pretty much know how the etalon function, the, the function of the, of the distance between the mirrors looks uh, as a function of wavelength. Um, and so uh, we, we can play the game in Carmenus. We can, we can measure the chromaticity in Carmenus. And this is, this is how it looks. You've seen these kind of images a few times. And if you sort of translate this into one number, a wavelength uh, or, or velocity drift uh, as a function of time, you can see what the vis on the left and the near on the right actually do over time. And the slopes are, um, I think, at least zeroth order consistent with what we've heard about how etalons behave um, during, during their time and as they age and get older together with us. And um, having done this, I switch uh, to two images that I am just throwing at you and um, buckle up. You may, may get scared because um, Carmenes is not an extremely stabilized spectrograph. So I think the calibration system, the calibration strategy that we have developed is really doing a great job. And of course, we, we need to implement more, more things here. For example, this chromaticity needs to go in. But what the instrument is really doing, uh, you can see here. So um, this is the scary picture of not, this is not the most scary picture of the day. I have one more. But um, this is showing you the seasons at Color Alto. So Carmenes really is a nice thermometer. Okay, this is, this is, it's really reacting. We did not really pay too much attention and money to actually stabilize it because we wanted to get to the mountain and we had to build two instruments. Um, and at the end of the day, we thought, okay, well, if we, we should be able to get away with this. This was not intended. We were hoping that it, or we were not hoping what it was designed to, to work better. As Andreas has said in his Maroon X talk, uh, RV temperature relations are about an order of magnitude worse than, than what we had sort of anticipated and whoever, no matter what, this is, this is what we have in, in the vis. It's sort of smooth. Uh, it has these jumps. This is when we regenerate the sorption, sorption pumps and otherwise you see the seasons on color alto here. So this is, this is what we have to deal with. Of course, a better uh, temperature uh, stabilization system would be nice. Uh, and for the near infrared, um, this is going to be the next plot. So um, just, just before you run away, that is, that is really, um, this was sort of new and we, we took the, we, we, the system for the temperature calibration uh, was something that was, uh, well, not, not that well tested, I guess, at that point. Uh, you can see a lot of chaos in the beginning and you see it smoothing down in 2018 and 2020 uh, to, to 2020. Uh, then, then chaos happened and we are now, uh, now we have really uh, implemented a new uh, temperature calibration system, a new uh, control for the nitrogen supply and that is supposed to deliver much better um, precision now. So um, this is something that you want to calibrate out. And of course, you can imagine that it's not, not very, I mean, there's a limit to it, right? So this is, this is just to show you what we deal with. And um, that is essentially it. So here's, I, I try to answer the question that were sent around by, by Sam and Andreas and, and Ryan before. Um, so we are using these, these different kind of lamps and, and uh, FP, of course, we fit with, with different uh, functions, whether that's good or not, and, and this can be tried around um, is, is uh, one question. We, 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 do, we uh, compute a new wavelength calibration solution every day and follow it uh, with the nightly drift with, with the etalons, and this is all based on the paper that we wrote in 2015 on, on how you can do this with Fabri Perot etalons. And um, we had serious jumps because the fiber coupling is, of course, as, as, most, as you, of course, know, is very important. So you, the, the, the fiber coupling uh, can lead to more serious jumps than the chromaticity effect that we've seen by, by, the, by the coding changing. But that is something that, of course, you can get under control. But it's a good idea to really make sure that the fiber coupling is stable and no one touches it. We've had this. Um, Okay, uh, we are, we are, right now we are, we are limited by long calibration sequences. This, is, this should change in the future. We, we should have a, an ex, uh, an upgrade of the calibration unit. And I think that is about it. Thank you.
and Ansgar questions. Thank you, Ansgar. Very interesting. Um, on your fiber coupling issue, um, have you guys thought about sort of pre scrambling or, or something to go before you go into the Edelon between your source and the Edelon? I think no. I mean, we thought about it, but we, we did implement it, right? So, of course, we, we thought about all kinds of stabilization things, uh, but this is a particular thing. I don't know, maybe Sebastian, he's, he's the father of EFPs, may tell you. So the issue Ansgar is referring to is um, it's reuse tungsten halogen lamps, and every time you change the bulb, then the bulb position changes. And that was before there were uh, octagonal fibers like laying around at each shop, so it's a normal circular fiber. And of course, if we were to update this, it would be an octagonal fiber to get rid of this, but uh, it's not in there. So since you broached the question of changing the lamps, and you guys are one of the teams that uses a lot of lamps, I would imagine. Um, how are you bridging across lamp changes? We talked about this back in like 2013 before you'd actually, any of us had actually done it. But I'm curious how well that's working and how, how consistent you're finding lamp to lamp and what you're doing about different vendors and the lamp catastrophe. Yeah. Um, I have to say that we, we did not really come across this lamp catastrophe. So we, we've seen a lot of lamps and we actually, all our lamps, we, we bought a lot of lamps at the beginning. We measured them all with the FTS and we look really detailed in, into whether we, we see any big contamination issues in the wavelength range that we are using, which is not between 400 and 500 nanometers. But, but red word of this, we do not really have big problems, I have to say. So that they are changing, of course, and the gas lines and every, everything is, is changing. But it's, it's not that much of a problem. And these lamp changes, I don't know, the, the jumps between the lamp changes are smaller than the other problems that we have, I think. Um, and we are, we are, of course, so we are mixing lamps sometimes, right? Going back and forth. But I mean, Matthias might correct me, I think he's online, but uh, I, I don't think we have any serious issues here. We actually had the plan to have like lamps that we use every other, every second week to have a master lamp and then a super duper master lamp. So we, we have a little tank that nobody touches, goes near to it. And there's, there's a master lamp that, that lasts for like a hundred years. We never used this. So at the end of the day, it wasn't necessary. Okay, any other questions? Oh, yeah, that's all right. So you have, you have shown uh, jumps of kilometer per second along the year, but uh, between successive um, wavelength calibrations, so between one night and the next, do you have also big variations or you are contained within kilometer per second? No, during the nights, I don't think I have a close up of, of this year, sorry, but um, during the night, it's typically smooth. So we have typical, uh, we have typical typical differences from night to night on the order of 10 meters per second in the, in the VIS channel. And this is, you can see this during the night on the Edelons. This is this is pretty much smooth during the night on, on that order. So um, we, are, we are following it. And this is this is the one reason why it's possible to calibrate out these catastroph catastrophic um, drifts. And I, I think um, the, the Edelon does a very good job uh, to that respect. So this is working apparently. Okay, let's thank our speaker again. And move on to our next talk by Bryce and Kale, um, talking about the Parvi wavelength solution. I urge you all to find a more appropriate um, sticker for this conference. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you uh, for coming out today. Uh, my name is Bryson Kale. Um, I'm a postdoc um, down at uh, Nexi, uh, just a few hours south of here. Uh, and I'm going to tell you today about the uh, Parvi uh, calibration system. That's something I've been working on for the last uh, one or two years now. Uh, and before I begin, I definitely want to thank all of the, um, uh, the Parvi people here. Some of them are in this room today. Um, that really have made Parvi possible and really helping to enable all the science that I enjoy uh, doing, and including the Palomar staff as well. They've been very helpful. 
Uh, so a quick overview, here's PARVI in all its glory. Um, it's on the Hale five meter telescope. Um, it is a diffraction limited spectrograph, which means it uses, uh, it's fed by uh, a diffraction limited beam uh, through single mode fibers. And so PARVI operates in the J and the H band, although right now we're only operating in the H band because that's where our LFC actually has um, the necessary contrast. Uh, it's a uh, designed uh, resolution of 90,000, but right now we're only getting around 60,000 and you'll see sort of why shortly. Uh, and to calibrate, we use uh, a combination of an LFC as our absolute reference and then the Etalon uh, to carry us say throughout the night. Uh, so here's a quick uh, close up of our par or the uh, laser frequency comb. Uh, it was built in house at Caltech and it has a mode spacing of 10 gigahertz. Um, and I like to show this plot because uh, it, it really shows here, we have the science fiber on the top and the calibration fiber on the bottom. And you can see, at least in the calibration fiber, the uh, thanks to Parvi's uh, very compact design, uh, the PSF is uh, not uh, as we would like, it is tilted on the detector. Um, and this tilt varies across an order and it varies of course between the different fibers. And uh, we're still ultimately working on taking this into account, but right now we're just doing um, what most other groups are doing, and that's just optimally extracting all of our spectra, including the comb spectra, uh, just column by column. All right, so now we wanna use the LFC to derive a wavelength solution. Uh, so uh, this is just an example of the, one, uh, the 1D spectrum from the LFC extracted. Um, and so I haven't really seen this, a plot like this at, to, uh, at this conference yet, um, but one of the questions, at least for our comb, is how we deal with this underlying super continuum, which kind of, uh, also follows the, uh, the, amp the intensity variations as well. And so this is kind of the most, I'd say, egregious example as far as how bad this super continuum can get and how the intensity variations uh, can vary across the order. Uh, but that said, it doesn't, um, uh, a lot of other, the other orders are also kind of uh, similarly uh, have this structure to them. Uh, so to derive a wavelength solution, we need to find where these LFC modes are. Uh, to do that, we just fit each mode individually with just a simple model, just a Gaussian plus a background polynomial, either a linear or a quadratic is usually uh, good enough. And so the only parameters we actually care about from this uh, model are the mean or the centroid of the Gaussian. And uh, we also propagate an uncertainty just through some uh, uh, finite differencing. All right, so uh, right now we're only using the H band. Uh, so this is around 150 modes per order times the 21 orders in the H band. Um, that's around 3,500 uh, LFC modes altogether. And so we just throw this all into this nice 2D Chebyshev polynomial framework or any orthogonal polynomials will probably work. Uh, and right now we're just still sort of testing maybe different polynomial degrees, but something like uh, nine and six for across an order and then across orders respectively uh, seems to work uh, reasonably well. Uh, and so before I show you how well this works, let me show you how well it doesn't work. Um, this is the uh, deep rabbit hole that I'm not gonna go into today because I definitely don't have near enough time. Um, but this is something that we've called, um, well, we can't really read it, but <laughs> it's called the accordion effect uh, as uh, coined by Rose Gibson. And uh, this is ultimately caused by temporally changing, a temporally changing polarization state uh, combined with a very uh, uh, birefringent sensitive optics within the spectrograph and sp uh, specifically our silicon uh, cross disperser. And so on this plot, I'm just showing you uh, for one order, uh, just the residuals um, um, across uh, the order. And you can see that one, they vary between plus or minus 500 meters per second, which is at least an order of magnitude above where we would all like to be. Um, and then maybe you can't quite tell on this scale, but there's a lot of structure as well. It's not noise, it's a lot of uh, sinusoidal, quasi sinusoidal like structure. And so this is not good. Uh, so I won't uh, go into all the details in this, but just know at the end of the day, we can scramble this out. And that is uh, what we do uh, for now. And so we scramble this out uh, and we get uh, the following set of residuals now for our whole uh, 21 orders. Uh, so here I'm showing all the residuals for all 21 orders. Uh, and so now our peak to peak is much more reasonable and just our quick, very conservative estimation of what the overall contribution is of our calibration is around say half a meter per second. All right, so now we have a wavelength solution, which is great. Um, and so now we wanna measure drips. And so to do this, we will combine our simultaneous uh, etalon spectrum. So every science observation also comes with a simultaneous uh, etalon trace. 
And we would compare that with some fiducial Edelon spectrum that's taken right after or before um, an LFC spectrum in time. And so we just assume that uh, any drifts between an Edelon and an LFC exposure are uh, negligible. So what does our Edelon look like? Um, well, here are its stats down below. And um, the Edelon modes are slightly resolved. And so they're a little wider than the, uh, the comb lines are. Um, and although the Edelon lines are not necessarily Gaussian, that's kind of sort of clear just by eye looking at the fits, uh, we still use a Gaussian plus a constant as our model just because it seems to work reasonably well still. All right. so. Now that we fit all of our uh, Edelon modes, we to compute a drift, we just take the weighted median of all the mode variations across the entire detector. So all roughly a few thousand uh, uh, Edelon modes. So right now we're not doing uh, any chromatic drifts. Right now we're just assuming all drifts are um, uh, constant for a given exposure. And these drifts are uh, computed in pixel space. So right now I'm just always working in detector pixels. And so uh, a natural correction, if we're working in pixel space, uh, to apply the drift uh, would just be to, in our uh, Chebyshev framework, would just be to subtract it off there at the very uh, bottom right um, for the uh, pixel um, coordinate. And so what do these drifts look like? Uh, so this is just a quick test over around 14 hours of baseline on the x-axis. And then on the y-axis in the top, I've plotted the drift of the science fiber and the calibration fiber for Parvi um, over this baseline. Um, and so here I'm working in pixels, but fortunately one millipixel is roughly uh, one meter per second ballpark. Um, and so ultimately what matters isn't over the overall drift, but what really matters is the relative drift between the science and the calibration fiber. And so, uh, what I've plotted in the bottom is the difference between the science and the calibration fiber. And you can see at the very end of the night, they disagree by roughly one millipixel or approximately one uh, meter per second. And so if we really wanna be confident with our wavelength solution and our calibration, it will more than likely be in our best interest uh, to calibrate maybe several times or one or two times throughout the night as well. <laughs> um, so that's one possibility. Or the other possibility is this idea that everyone else has been talking about drift versus detector position or chromatic uh, drifts. And so maybe tools like Excalibur, like Lily has developed, or um, uh, the framework that maybe Andreas has developed for Maroon X could be uh, in our interest as well. Uh, so I'll leave you with a more uh, exciting rascal at the end. And I just want to thank all the Parvi people again uh, for all the help. Uh, that they've given me um, over the last uh, few years. So thank you, and I will take any questions. So you showed the super continuum variation in the in the comb. How how temporally variable is that in your comb? Because I I mean we see that in our combs as well. Um, and in one of our combs, it's pretty constant and doesn't move around and doesn't really matter. And in the other comb, it varies from minute to minute. Um, and, and so we have spectral flatteners that take that out. But without that, I could imagine that that's a huge problem if it's moving underneath you. Yeah, the short answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, they vary in time. Um, and that variation in time is also chromatic. Uh, one order might change quite a bit. One order might be a little more stable. Um, and uh, how, how much that may or may not impact our calibration is really still, uh, I think, an un unanswered question. But that is definitely something that's always been bugging me, uh, certainly. Thanks for the talk, Bryson. Um, I had a question about the super continuum as well. I think when we, when we fit it out, the spectral flatteners don't, they don't, they don't take up the super continuum background. Um, and so did I understand correctly that the, um, the way that's being dealt with now is just in the, the parameters and the individual line fits? You see that? So I wonder if it might be worth a try to do something that connects the information across the, the different lines because it's a little bit smooth. Um, that's, that's helped us in the past. I think. Uh, yeah, that is definitely something that um, I think Rose, who's also developed a similar framework that I'm doing, um, has taken that approach, and it seems to give at the very end of the day um, at least a similar uh, one-off calibration, um, a wavelength solution set of residuals. Um, but uh, as far as utilizing the LFC for um, uh, 
down the road and being more confident in what uh, the information it's telling us. I do want to treat, um, I don't want to treat the modes individually. I do want to have more of a, a, a single model across the detector that varies smoothly, um, including the, the, uh, the Gaussian widths, which, which right now I'm just um, assuming are totally independent. Um, but they definitely do clearly vary smoothly across the order. Okay, hey, second to last speaker, Chad Bandra, talking about uh, the newer wavelength solution. Okay, so this is really a collaboration between many people on the team, but earlier today, Ryan and myself, and since he's frantically taking notes, I said I would stand up and, and give the talk, but I may, uh, may reach to him um, since he's responsible for a lot of this particular software. So um, we've heard a lot about NUID, so I'm not really going to describe uh, the instrument a great deal, except to say that um, we have an interesting problem in that we span a very, very large wavelength regime from about um, 360 nanometers, although officially 380, but really 360, um, to longer than a micron. And so we do not have a calibration source that is good over that full wavelength range. And so we have a terrible bootstrap um, to, to try and tease this out. We have a Menlo laser frequency comb um, that covers the bandpass shown up here on the upper, see the cursor, yeah, on the upper right. Um, and uh, it goes down to about 5,200 angstroms, plus or minus 100 angstroms on any given night. Um, we have an etalon, uh, which is uh, illuminated by a NKT Super K Extreme Super Continuum laser um, that uh, is much more stable over short time scales. Um, but we have a problem there that we'll show later uh, where we burn through supercontinuum lasers about one per year. It's a very expensive spare part. Um, and every time they come back from NKT, they are different. So that's interesting. Um, and then we have thorium argon lamps. Um, one unique and not advantageous design in our calibration system is that all of our calibration light goes into an integrating sphere, which means that our exposures are fairly long this is fine for laser comb and etalon, but for thorium, it's a problem. And so this also means that we burn through thorium lamps pretty quickly. Um, when we first started operations, a thorium lamp was lasting us about two months. Um, we've modified the calibration sequence, so now we get about four or five months out of a lamp. Um, this is why I have a lamp catastrophe, uh, because I cannot buy them anymore. Um, the instrument uh, has a large, slow, long-term bulk drift. Um, this is showing uh, from when we started up the instrument the second time in December of 2020 and cooled it down uh, until uh, May of that year. And we saw this large uh, 150 meter per second uh, long-term drift that correlates well um, with bench temperature. It's not surprising, it's slow and smooth. Um, there are a few events in here that correspond to known events. Um, mechanical work on SPECTRAF could also say Chad went and uh, took off the ion pump. So that's the release of a KF40 fitting on the far edge of the thing caused it to do that. Um, we also have a short-term drift uh, that's due to our liquid nitrogen fills day to day. Um, this very, very repeatable sawtooth pattern um, that is about two meters per second uh, over the course of the day. And this is just because when you pump nitrogen into the tank, the whole thing starts swinging back and forth very slowly and it slowly damps out over time and it causes gravity changes inside the tank. Um, so nitrogen is good for some things and not good for others. Our wavelength solution uh, module in the pipeline, as I alluded to, is a bootstrap. Um, we redo the wavelength solution every night. We take evening calibrations at about four o'clock mountain time in the evening uh, that include laser comb in each of our fibers, etalon in each of our fibers, 
thorium in the calibration fiber. We don't have enough time to afford to do it in the science fiber as well. And we re-zero everything to that point of time at the beginning of the night. And then we use the etalon throughout the night um, to calculate uh, the instantaneous drift uh, for each science exposure. Um, and we have a variety of different algorithms that get used depending on the quantity uh, and the quality of the calibration exposures that are taken. Um, the worst case is that the, uh, the laser comb doesn't turn on and we have very small backs that still allow us to calibrate that data, but in a less high quality way, um, depending on the number of simultaneous etalons we get throughout the night, we use various algorithms to, to calculate that. So what that um, looks like here, so the um, laser comb, I think we've, we've seen lots of laser comb spectra before. This is just one sample order. Um, we have many hundreds of comb modes across our 9,000 pixel wide detector. Um, we, we span more than the blaze. Um, so we uh, pick up uh, the next orders on either end, um, which we're actually able to fit quite well and include um, and order to order uh, wavelength solutions match quite well. Um, if we zoom in a little bit, here's what that actually looks like. Um, we typically get bursts of LFC exposures. We'll take three to six, depending on the fiber um, at each time. And so we can calculate ensemble distributions for each comb mode. Um, we're fitting them with Gaussians, nothing terribly fancy. And they're, at the moment, they're independent. They're not being fit together, but this is on our list to, to do. I think there's, there's straightforward ways to improve this. Um, Throughout the night, uh, the instrument drifts up uh, over a couple of meters per second, as I said. Um, we take, uh, sometimes we take simultaneous CALs, depending on the science target being observed. This is at the discretion of the PI who puts in the, their observation. Um, for fainter objects, most people choose not to do that. Uh, but the Q observers, while the telescope is slewing, will fire off a couple of etalons um, in that minute or two that it takes the telescope to slew. And so we're frequently able to populate the whole drift throughout the night, something that looks, this is a sparsely sampled night, this is a more tightly sampled night, um, even if we don't have simultaneous etalon exactly coincident with science exposure, we have it bracketing throughout the night. And in the pipeline, we use all of these frames together to calculate a nightly drift um, and then uh, interpolate uh, the wavelength solution for the night. A um, couple of other operational things that we've noticed and uh, don't have solutions for yet. We are highly dependent for, for NUID to meet its precision requirements, which for us involves lots of NASA paperwork and signatures and actually written down mission requirements, requires the laser comb. It was never optional. Um, and we have nights where it does not work. Um, those nights have decreased substantially since we commissioned it. But for the first year, um, the reliability was maybe at best at 70%. Now we're higher than that. Um, and, but it's also difficult to predict in advance whether it will work or not work for any given night. So this presents an operational problem. Um, we do, we take exposures assuming that it's working, which means that sometimes we end up with blank exposures in our CAL sequence that the pipeline has to handle. We end up with irregularly exposed exposures um, that have changing flux values through them. And so this has complicated things quite a bit. Um, and we're not doing a good job right now of cleaning that up and, and handling it robustly, but it's on the list if I can stop restarting the instrument every nine months. Um, the other thing we, we, we definitely know about the chromatic drifts um, in, in our new at Etalon, um, and it's on, on our list. I think uh, this is a good option to get more information uh, about the wavelength solution outside of the laser comb band. Um, in that range from 4,000 to 5,000 angstroms where we have etalon, but we don't have laser comb. We can still, we can use this to expand the information from the laser comb regime down into that regime. The other thing that is interesting here shown on the lower right um, is something that we're still probing. This is um, velocity drift of the etalon that we have measured because we can measure that relative to the laser comb over long time periods. And the break point that you see here is after we changed the supercontinuum source in the uh, summer, August uh, 21 uh, summer shutdown, 
Uh, so we burned through one PCF um, and we swapped to a spare super continuum laser. And after that, it behaved differently. And we did this again last summer. And after that, it behaved differently. So we, we're still trying to understand this, but um, these, these high powered super continuum sources um, are not so trivial to use. Uh, it's not the same source that we're using for the HPF Edelon um, that puts out you know, milliwatts. This thing puts out two watts and it heats the cavity and yeah, it's quite a pain. So I think that is the last slide. There's lots of backup slides, but. Thanks, Chad. On, on the slide before, when you showed the dense, the, yeah, the, do I see a pattern there? Is it just me? Is it five minute oscillations? What, what is that? Is there anything? This is complicated and I might have to rope Brian into it. Um, so there's a few things shown on this, on this plot. We have this, um, this green trace Pointer, I guess, is up there, but not down here. The green trace is showing our kind of average built up over many, many nights, what the typical um, drift pattern is. And that does get folded in in a weighted sense into how we calculate the drift for every night because the sampling, the temporal sampling for every night is random. It's going to change every night depending exactly how the observations were set up. Um, and then there probably is a little bit of higher order structure in there. I mean, I think that these, these wiggles here, I cannot explain them physically, but they are, they are real in the sense that if you, if you average drifts over six months, that's what comes out. So something coherent is happening there. I don't, yeah, I can't explain it mechanically though. So in fact, right, yeah, like at 0.5, you can see um, it's different from night to night at the, at the few centimeters per second level at any given point. But our goal is, you know, that this only contributes at the few centimeters per second level to the entire error budget or things start to break. I was just going to make the point. It does mean then that we uh, we don't want to just jet jettison the calibration frames that we would take during the night. Um, those are still important and valuable at that level. Taking simultaneous calibrations is something that we pioneered that Joe talked about earlier with with HPF. We do the same thing there. So we're taking exposures throughout the night in between science exposures, and we're using very similar algorithms to to so that anyone who tasks science on that night benefits from all of the ensemble of the exposures that were taken. While I run back, do you leave your super K on all the time? Just sort of curiosity is that how over these two meters per second, how much do the two fibers drift relative to each other? At the left side of this plot, of this overall cool down plot, um, they're moving relative to each other at meters per second or tens of meters per second initially, and that's slowly stabilizing over time. Um, so that a couple of months into a run, uh, this has gotten very, very small. Um, we still calibrate it out every night, but we don't calibrate it out throughout the night. We just, we, we re-zero it at the beginning of the night. I don't have a number on the top of my head, but it's, go to the last slide. The really last slide or the, 
We have a lot of slides up. This, okay, nope. This, this shows the, the measured answer to that question, essentially um, the differential drift measured across each day with the Edelon spectrum. So this, the difference between the science and the calibration fibers uh, offset with one constant uh, for each day and then overlapping uh, for several days uh, where we took data for this, for the initial um, uh, ORR. And so you can get a sense of what the distribution of those looks like across a night there. It's, I think it's a little bit above the photon noise. Um, yeah, yeah, we did estimate this here, right? So there's a little bit of extra noise uh, in here somewhere that's uh, related to something that's above the photon noise. But the photon noise, if I remember on these exposures is typically like three to four centimeters per second. So there is, there is extra noise in here. Um, this is also why, you know, I've talked this week with a variety of people about frequently restarting instruments and the impact of, ins of restarting instruments. And this is one of the, you know, this is reasonably stable once the instrument's been going for six months, but um, it's much, much worse than this for the first couple of months. So <clears throat> if the super K thing is such a huge problem, have you thought about using two etalons, uh, which both maybe have contributions in the LFC region where so you can tie it to the LFC still, but use an LED as light source, for example? Um, no, but I'm happy to talk with you offline about how we would implement that. We also have an unfortunate problem about Sam. Uh, yeah, so we looked at um, a, a, a suite of LEDs in the blue and trying to just sort of tune the tune some combination that gives us a magical spectrum. I think the problem was we could never find a commercial solution that had high enough power density in a single mode fiber. Because we're going into a single mode fiber and then an inner ring sphere. And so. And, and I agree with Chris, I just don't have a better solution. Our next speaker is Andreas Seifert from University of Chicago. So technically we have reached the end of the session, right? So uh, if you want to stick around for another 10 minutes, um, I'll show you the what some people call the secret source of uh, squeezing a short-term performance of 30 centimeters or so um, out of an instrument that at least at the beginning of its lifetime had about 100 meter per second uh, drift over a night. Um, I'm also a little bit scared because all previous speakers have been uh, perfectly on time and uh, this talk will look a little bit different, I think, uh, going a little bit deeper into the weeds. So I hope I'm I'm making it in 10 minutes. But in principle, we're talking about something that we have heard before, which is like, if you have an instrument that is not intrinsically very stable, you have to use a good calibration source. And by good, I mean something that has local information content and, and, and uh, if possible, um, equal information content over your spectrum. And that a comb spectrum, whether it comes from an LFC or an etalon, it doesn't matter, that makes a huge difference. And then it's the question of how you apply that information uh, matching what your spectrograph is doing without uh, introducing noise in the, in the process. And so for us, for us, the calibration scheme falls in three parts. Uh, it's a master wavelength solution that is based on an etalon, but anchored to a thorium micron spectrum. Um, and then we derive a drift solution just based on the etalon lines in the simultaneous calibration uh, fiber referenced to etalon lines taken um, in the science fibers at the beginning and the end of the night. And part three is kind of an uh, you know, ad hoc um, um, at the end, which is then uh, we have to then correct for the drift of the etalon itself. So uh, the first part is the, the fitting of the etalon lines. Um, and we have an unresolved uh, etalon high finesse um, <clears throat> fed with a single mode fiber. So intrinsically that etalon is very stable. Uh, and we use an analytical uh, line spread function for that. 
um, that is uh, physically motivated. So we have a box that represents our rectangular fiber that forms the slit of the spectrograph, uh, convolved with two one-sided Gaussians that represent the operations that you uh, introduce with your optics. Um, and that actually is just a simple combination of two error functions. So numerically actually very straightforward. Um, and then we have a, a background term. Now the box width and the Gaussian sigmas are highly uh, degenerate. So we decided to have the uh, width of the box and the sigma of the Gaussians fit to a slowly varying polynomial over an order and only fit the amplitude and the position of each of the etalon lines uh, freely. And that's still a relatively computational expensive uh, process. So on the upper left, this is just a, uh, uh, some sim order of now the 90s in the middle of the detector, I think on the red channel. Um, and it's, you, know, you don't really see anything in the top left plot because it's just a, a forest of lines. Um, but uh, it's just to demonstrate, we obviously divide by the flat field uh, first to take out the, the uh, blaze, otherwise your lines are all skewed and shifted. But you can compare then basically the, the uh, normalized uh, line intensities in the residuals and we are about at the level of 1% um, uh, peak, peak to valley uh, photos fits. So on the right hand side, it's the same thing, just uh, zoomed in and you basically by eye cannot you know, distinguish between data and fit. That's really that good. And you see the residuals again. The residuals are not random. There's still structure in them. So that model is not perfect and we didn't expect it to be perfect, but um, we think that that model is actually good enough. And on the lower left, you basically see these like slowly varying uh, parameters um, for box width, which is basically your slit width, which very slowly over uh, an order. This is your anamorphic magnification of the shell. And then you have this, what I call this, the, the smile pattern um, in your operations, which is well at the orders, uh, um, the edges of the orders, you have typically higher operations. And so um, it's expected that this uh, goes up. Now you have all your etalon line positions, but you only have them in pixel space and you have no idea where they are in wavelength space. So you have to reference them um, to an absolute anchor. And so for us, again, that's a thorium argon based uh, wavelength solution. Um, we had not have the luxury to uh, uh, come through, you know, dozens or I'm, I don't know how many you actually got Ansgar initially like uh, thorium argon lamps. So we ordered a few and started using them and they look horrible. Um, so what can I say? I mean, I'm, I'm you know, I, I understand that they vary a lot from batch to batch and maybe we just got unlucky, but um, uh, there are a few orders that look by eye, very beautiful because it's a beautiful uh, molecular spectrum of thorium oxide, but it's it's very hard to actually measure anything in there. So it helps a lot to have actually your line spread function model from the uh, etalon fit to go and then fit the um, uh, uh, thorium lines. Also because our um, line spread function is nowhere near a Gauss. It's much steeper because of that um, uh, rectangular slit and not kind of a round or octagonal uh, fiber input. Um, and then we do a lot of clipping, mainly based on is the actual line that we fit there much broader than the intrinsic line spread function, which would indicate um, that we have um, a blend that we don't um, re resolve. And then we typically skip that line. Um, and there's some other steps of sigma clipping involved. And we end up with approximately 2,500 um, lines on the blue chip and 1,600 lines on the red chip. Um, and because we have these gaps, particularly in these orders where we have a lot of thorium uh, oxide, um, we use a 2D polynomial wavelength uh, solution to make up for these uh, gaps in individual orders. And we found we need about an eighth degree polynomial in, in X, which is our dispersion direction, and about a sixth degree in cross order in um, cross dispersion direction. And that's the typical distribution of residuals. And because I use the same style of plots um, a few more times, let me walk you through this. Uh, typically on the top, I show a cut in cross dispersion direction. So each order is a different color and they, because it's a smooth color palette, it looks like we have only eight orders, but um, each of these little um, uh, points that denote the mean there shows a different order, so typically 26 per uh, chip both for the blue and the red. So that's uh, wavelength um, across um, cross dispersion. And then at the bottom is basically the same thing, but plotted over um, uh, the dispersion direction. And so this is over plotted uh, for each order. So you can basically look for structures in the residuals um, 
uh, in, in both directions. So that's the blue chip, and we have about, again, depends on where you put your sigma clipping, 170 meters per second or so, uh, RMS, and the same number in the red with just you know, fewer lines. So equipped with that, you can now go and uh, finally assign wavelength uh, to your etalon. And what you have to do is you have to fit the S-built etalon spacer thickness. Um, you have to assign order numbers, the appearance order numbers to your lines, and you have to solve for your chromatic dispersion. Uh, and we do that on the thorium argon derived uh, wavelength solution. And as people who have went through this process know, these numbers are highly degenerate. Um, and so you have to start with a certain assumption. And instead of basically assuming anything like global flatness of your, um, of your dispersion curve or things like that, we actually went ahead and started with uh, an actual uh, model of the um, as expected chromatic dispersion based on a thin film mirror coding stack calculation. So that's work done by uh, Julian Stürmer in 2019. Um, and that's basically as it looks like. Now I have combined both chips. So we have the complete wavelength coverage of the instrument here. We have basically the residuals, which is your chromatic dispersion, the difference between an ideal etalon and the realized one plotted on top. That rainbow colored stuff is the actual measured position of the etalon lines on the uh, thorium argon solution. The red curve is uh, the model and the residuals are uh, plotted at the bottom. And you already see these weird structures. Um, and um, we, and I don't describe now much of the details here, but we had went to great strides to actually um, improve this fit and, and fit the dispersion solution nicer without uh, imprinting the shortcomings of the thorium argon solution. Um, into the um, uh, final dispersion solution. And we used the cubic spline fit for that. And there went a little bit of thought into like how to uh, place the, the knots and things like that. So that's the final result. Um, we refitted our dispersion curve and then have basically the residuals down here. And if you would zoom in, you would basically see the classical pattern of, uh, well, a lower order polynomial will basically swing up at the edges where you have less signal to noise um, in your data. And um, that's, yeah, what, what, what you expect. So now you have all these great um, etalon wavelengths and you can go and build a, a nicer wavelength solution with that. And I wish I had made a video, what happens if you crank up the number of um, uh, uh, parameters on your 2D etalon, so, uh, sorry, 2D polynomial solution, um, residuals shrink down. We have seen before something like 40 meter per second um, residuals on the thorium argon solution with the etalon, but you can crank this up all the way until you get numerically instable. Um, so for example, in Y direction, our cross order direction, we only have 25, 26 orders. So 23rd order polynomial is rather extreme. Um, and you still are left with structured residuals. So that's on the blue chip. You see some wiggles in the middle uh, on top in cross dispersion direction and also um, in dispersion direction, relatively prominent at the bottom. And a similar picture for the red camera where you have almost nothing in dispersion direction, but quite a lot of wiggles in cross dispersion direction. And so that's like peak to valley in the mean of uh, an order of about one to two meter per second. Uh, and so we scratched our head and said, okay, what's that? And then we did some simulations and figured the aberration pattern of Maroon X is so complex and fastly changing because of that, sorry, stupid pupil compression. Um, <laughs> that um, there's, there's no way a 2D polynomial will adequately describe what we are seeing here. This is a general problem. If you think about, for example, a single order typically spans, what, 4,000 kilometer per second, a pixel is a kilometer per second, and you want to locally go down to a meter per second, that's a lot. And if you have a lot of structure in there, a polynomial is not a good description for that. And so you can go and work with a physical model, that's one solution, but costly. The other is we simply said, okay, let's not parameterize that with a polynomial. Let's again, use a cubic spline. And so I basically said, um, I use a cubic spline with 30 knots. That was the solution that gave me the, the least um, uh, uh, structure uh, remaining in the residuals without, so to speak, overfitting. Um, and that's what we ended up with. Um, so it's an individual order by order um, cubic spline solution. And so you end up with typical RMS residuals here of about five meters in the blue and also about four meters or so in the red. Um, and while we are not reaching a photo noise limit, 
the overall distribution of the residuals actually follows the expectation from um, the throughput of the spectrograph plus the inherent spectrum um, or spectral envelope, if you want, um, of the uh, etalon. So that basically gives us a master uh, a wavelength solution. And more importantly, uh, this whole process gave us um, our basic etalon parameters. How do we do the drift solution? So in Maroon X, we have three science fibers. These are the top uh, traces in the right-hand side and left-hand side plot. Uh, left-hand side, I show a science spectrum. On the right-hand side, the calibration frame. So in each science spectrum, we have our etalon spectrum in there. Um, and uh, we take a calibration frame at the beginning and end of the night where we put etalon light in all fibers. And so we can basically calculate line by line offsets between the same lines um, in the science fiber um, and in the uh, simultaneous calibration fiber and basically say, where would that line be in our science frame if it wouldn't be occupied by science light uh, and derive a new uh, cubic spline um, solution for that. And that's uh, what we typically get. So this is one random science frame. This is the red channel. Um, and this is the difference uh, of etalon line positions in the simultaneous calibration fiber between that science frame and probably the beginning of the night uh, reference frame. Um, and again, the colors denote orders. And then I started basically looking at that and said, OK, uh, that has a lot of structure in it, but also a lot of noise. And now you basically have the choice, how do you separate the two? And you know, there are various approaches to that. Um, what we eventually decided on is, um, if you look in the bottom plot where this is like in um, a dispersion direction across an order, you say, well, you know, uh, but if, you, if you ignore the noise, there is basically a smooth trend. Um, and so let's again fit that with a cubic spline, but this time only three knots um, so there's, there's a high level of smoothness um, imposed on that, and then simply add that to the uh, solution from the master reference frame in the science fiber. And you see those are actually very smoothly varying if you, if you look on top, um, but they are different from one uh, um, order to the, to the next smoothly going through. And you see that if you have a, a global RV drift of in this case 10 meter per second, there are rather large differences in dispersion direction and in cross dispersion direction, right? That spectrograph does not behave as a solid thing moving around. Um, and so it's, I think it's important to actually, um, you know, uh, solve the drift on that kind of level. So um, have a 2D um, drift map, uh, you know, in principle, the same philosophical approach as what uh, Xavier um, uh, presented on Tuesday or um, the Excalibur approach for Express uh, presented by uh, Lily. And then again, we, we can apply that and correct that, get our wavelength solution for the science fiber and typical RMS values again, only slightly larger um, by 10%, 20% or so. Um, and that's kind of the distribution of the residuals per order, again, uh, consistent with what we expect from, from the uh, purely signal to noise perspective. So the issues we have encountered uh, uh, using that, uh, the first two I've basically already touched on, 2D polynomial solution does not work for us because of the complexity of the aberration uh, uh, pattern. Uh, issue number two is the signal to noise limit you have with this uh, um, simultaneous calibration fiber spectrum that, that uh, prevents you from applying each line shift um, you know, one to one. Um, issue number three is that the wings of the etalon lines in cross dispersion direction contaminate the science spectrum. And so what we do is we basically take um, uh, darks throughout the night with exactly the same exposure times and settings um, for the simultaneous calibration fiber brightness um, and uh, you know, uh, use them as darks, as we call them, and subtract them from the science frame to remove the uh, imprint of the, the, the far out wings of the etalon lines from the, from the science uh, frame. Um, and the other issue that we all only recovered relatively uh, late in the game is at the very blue edge of the blue chip, there is uh, uh, the, the etalon is very, very faint. Um, and if you observe a star that Maroon X was not built for, um, solar type star, you get a lot of light there from the star. And so you have stray light issue actually um, from the star uh, imposed on um, your etalon uh, spectrum. And that skews your line profiles. 
because that stray light does not follow the, the, the normal background that the uh, fiber sees from only the uh, uh, etalon. And so that has basically skewed our, our uh, drift solution for the bluest orders by a couple of meters per second. Fortunately, they, they are not very important for the overall uh, radio velocity computations. But if you look line by line, or you're really caring about chromatic index and these things, that um, really makes a difference. Um, and so there's probably a number of other issues that are hidden here and things that could be further improved. But um, that's what I would say is what makes this work for us. Thank you. Uh, I'm curious how you figured out that that ripple you were seeing the residuals was caused by the um, the aberration. Just how you tracked it down. Well, first we started um, playing with a lot of different um, polynomial models. Right, there's more than just two D Legendre. There are others that would be uh, sensitive to other uh, numerical issues in a way. And we, we always hit the wall. There was, we always saw these residuals. They then look different because it's not actually the pattern that is there. It's just the residuals that you pick up with your insufficient model. And so um, what, what I did is basically I tried to use, um, but back in the day, we didn't have Pi Shell, um, a simulation code that, that um, Julian Stürmer wrote to actually do 2D uh, simulated uh, spectra. I, you know, brute force used CMAX for that. Um, and did some simulations that, okay, if this is my extracted spectrum with all the um, aberrations and distortions that the camera imposes, um, you know, and started to fitting um, actual um, uh, polynomials to these spectra, um, I saw that, you know, that's, that I see the same thing, basically. So that's intrinsic to our problem. I didn't go so far and say, okay, what if the optics would look nicer? Uh, what kind of polynomial would be sufficient? At that point, I was just, okay, this is not working. Let's look for something else. So I have a forward looking question here. You're about to get an LFC. So, <laughs> so how is that going to change your, um, your existing calibration scheme? Well, what I haven't touched on here is kind of that, as I said uh, in the very beginning, that ad hoc correction afterwards of our etalon drift. Uh, we had initially planned to use a rubidium uh, uh, anchor on one of the etalon lines. Unfortunately, due to, you know, it's our favorite excuse, I guess, COVID um, and other issues, we never got that running again on the mountain reliably, although it worked beautifully in the lab. Um, so we, we anyway had to look and use the thorium argon solution that we do every day uh, during daytime to slowly track uh, the bulk drift of the etalon over time, which is about two and a half centimeter per second. Um, but then I looked really, really hard for chromatic stuff because your guys' papers came out and I was absolutely shocked because a few years ago, um, I would have believed there's no chromatic dispersion change, right? Uh, what in the world could happen to coatings in vacuum that could, you know, make 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 them change? Um, so it it uh, it was only an afterthought that uh, we are like, okay, let's look whether we see something as well. And um, I had to improve our our thorium argon solution by a lot to to do that. It's basically yeah, I have to first correct for the instrumental drift with that drift approach. Um, and on top of that, basically calculate the, the thorium argon um, solution. Then I get down globally to, a, to our mass of about 20 centimeters between individual um, uh, thorium frames, but that's globally, right? Per, okay, per chip, but still globally. If I then want to start basically resolving that in wavelength, that quickly you know, becomes unfeasible. Uh, we should have the time baseline by now, it's almost four years. Um, to actually do that. And so talking to a few of you and, and looking at things, I'm a bit worried that I'm doing something wrong, that I don't see, I see chromatic changes, but they are so deep in the noise that I can't use them to actually correct things. And that's where the LFC comes in, right? I can finally get rid of the, the LFC, uh, sorry. <clears throat> that boats not very well. Um, <laughs> I, can, I can get rid of the thorium argon lamp. Um, 
uh, Freudian, okay, um, and use the LFC for that. And that should give us the, the information content we need to do that. So we will continue with using the Etalon uh, in our nightly frames and only use the LFC once a day or whatever to, to anchor the, the uh, Etalon. I can totally see why you want an LFC, but did you did you ever try uranium neon or thorium neon? Uranium argon actually for your case probably. I for those online, the answer was no. <laughs> Any other questions for Andreas to wrap up? I've got one. Um, you mentioned the uh, the complexity and higher aberration distribution is likely the cause or one of the causes of the residual labels. Have you tried this in Vmax or or pie shell by a shell to see if those are generally consistent? No. Um, again, one of the things on the many many pages uh, wish list of things I would like to try, particularly since we have these great tools now to actually do that. Um, also, what I didn't touch on here is that uh, because of how Maroon X is built and, and issues that happened on the mountain, we do see instrumental profile changes over long timescales, and that's basically screwing up our long-term precision. Um, and um, that, that is something we both have to improve, but also better understand. Um, and that part of that process is um, to revisit our, our wavelength solution. All right, if no other questions, so thanks Andreas again and all the speakers. All right, that concludes the splinter session. Thank you all for joining. Hope it was a productive couple of days and we'll see you in the main room. <laughs>